Oh. He's back from the celestial adventure that he was on, and Joe Reyes got all sorts of things to tell us about his day yesterday with the solar eclipse. Uh, we have, uh, after it's really probably one of the best days we've seen in a long time, uh, well, guess what? It's the weekly major storm that's going to be impacting the eastern part of the United States with late week rain and wind and who knows what else. Uh, we'll cover it all, severe weather across the south with uh, heavy rain, and well, we'll talk about the weekend and the long range. That's all tonight on a fact-loaded Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast, which is brought to you by Tempest by Weatherflow. Get the revolutionary Tempest weather system and join the fastest-growing observing weather network on the planet. The link is on the description to this podcast, and be sure if you make any purchases, be it the weather station or anything else from the Tempest website, to use the coupon code WINTER2324, because if you do, you will get 10% off. A big 10! So, having just walked in the door from the traffic, is Joe Rayo. He barely made it 24 hours later. You look no worse for wear. Uh, well, it <laughs> going was not too bad. I mean, on Sunday, we uh, took approximately four hours to get from here in Putnam Valley up to Plattsburgh, New York. Coming back was a whole different story. In fact, Joe, literally right after totality ended, the uh, the sheriff who happened to be on the uh, uh, Andy guess, Taylor, no, not Andy Taylor, but uh, a sheriff who happened to be on the grounds in Plattsburgh, where myself and uh, also Dennis Cassia and his wife Kim and uh, his good friend uh, Andy Sager and a whole bunch of other people, he said, "Well, I guess you folks are going to be staying here tonight." And we said, "Why? What's what's going on?" He says, "87 is is practically." going nowhere um this is interstate 87 now we intended to take that back south back to uh back home and uh he said i don't know what to tell you you know and, and renata of course made the comment like well we were thinking that if that happened we take some of the smaller roads like 22 or 9n or you know all other little he said well you could try that he said but i have a feeling a lot of people once they get stuck on 87 are going to do the same thing well, we, it, it, things got go, going. We, we were pretty good on uh, Route 22 going south, but then we ran into a whole mess of traffic, and that was the beginnings of our problem. To make a long story short, what took us four hours to go from here to there took us over eight hours to get back. Uh, it was one long... You know, just, just think of the worst day you can ever remember on the Long Island Expressway, and... Uh, that was kind of like what we what we had to deal with all the way down for about 300 miles. It was not fun, but I'll tell you, it was absolutely amazing what we saw yesterday, and it was well worth it. I, I tell you true, uh, what, we, what we witnessed in Plattsburgh uh, yesterday afternoon was, was gorgeous. Number 14 for me, and this was, somebody asked me, where does this rank? I said, well, out of the 14, this might be uh, among the top three. It was, a, it was a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. Great. I, you know, it's wonderful that you got to experience it. That, that's um, that's terrific. And uh, now you can just sort of forge ahead, but you do have some things to show. Well, before you do that, let me just give a big hello to everybody on the chat board and uh, welcome to tonight's Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast. And those of you uh, lurking in the background, a big hi and big hugs to you too. Uh, we're on the Sunday through Thursday at 7.35 p.m. Uh, and occasionally on a Friday and Saturday if there's a big storm going on. And uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe and hit the uh, turn the notifications on so you don't miss this. And if you do like the show, hit the like button. Because this way Joe can ring the bells, which he didn't take with him upstate, but he's got them all ready to go. So, yeah, you've got um, you've got stuff to share. From your uh, experience i i mean i have i have some photographs but i haven't even had a chance to look at them more carefully and to post them on phrase facebook um in addition to all the driving i did yesterday i had to drive my sister back to the bronx so that was lots of fun uh going down the sprain brook and then getting stuck on the taconic because there was like three accidents on the way back 
So I've been living, it seems like I've been living in, a, in cars for the last three days, but um, I'll put those on Facebook. But what I do have, Joe, is an amazing video uh, that uh, was shot by my uh, daughter uh, from the eclipse path. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow this up a little bit so that you could get a good view of it. This is a time lapse video that she took using her phone. Um, let me just blow this up here. Can you, can you see that? Yep. See that? All right. We were on the campus of Clinton Community College in Plattsburgh. And so my daughter uh, took her iPhone, I think it was an iPhone 12, mounted it on a very simple tripod. And then about five minutes before totality, she aimed the camera toward the southwest in the direction of the approaching dark lunar shadow. Now, you could see here, again, this is about five minutes before totality, we had high, thin, broken clouds at about 25,000 feet, kind of softening up the sunshine, but still, you still needed the special eclipse glasses because the sun was still blindingly bright to the eye. And, um, you know, we, we noticed that it was getting darker, you know, about you know, 10 or 15 minutes before, ever so slightly. But I think I made a comment that the arrival of the shadow, the dark shadow that plunges you into darkness and uh, is the start of the total eclipse, I made a reference to the uh, soap opera, the TV soap opera, The Edge of Night, uh, which some of you may remember from more than a few years ago. Uh, the, uh, the way that show started, they'd have some dramatic piano music, and then all of a sudden you'd see a skyline with literally a sharp edge of darkness moving across the screen. And as the darkness moved across the screen, as soon as it did, behind the edge of darkness, all the lights in the various skyscrapers would go on. And that was, I guess, the uh, use of the term, the edge of night. A total eclipse of the sun, especially if there's high clouds in the sky, to help act as kind of a screen in the uh, atmosphere to help you see the leading edge of the shadow of the moon a bit better. This really shows it all up. This, again, was a, a time lapse taken by my daughter. What you're going to see, it's only about 23, 25 seconds long, cramming in approximately 3 minutes and 32 seconds of totality in 25 seconds. And again, what you're going to see is the approach of the dark shadow of the moon lifting up like a tidal wave of darkness above the southwestern horizon and then like a gigantic blanket thrown over your head the shadow is on you uh and then you're suddenly pl you suddenly go well you see this here this is five minutes before totality and it is apparently looking like a sky 20 or 30 minutes before sunset it's somewhat dimmer than a normal bright sunny sky but you did notice at that point five minutes before totality and about 95 percent of the sun covered you did notice that the landscape was somewhat dimmer in less than 30 seconds it goes from 20 or 30 minutes before sun, sunset to like 30 or 40 minutes after sunset, dark, and uh, dark enough so that we were able to see, although it doesn't really show up too well in this uh, uh, time lapse, we were able to see Venus, we were able to see the planet Jupiter come out, and uh, it, was, it was just absolutely amazing. And then all too rapidly, the totality phase ends, and then you'll see the back end of the shadow lifting up and off over us as uh, totality came to an end. Watch quickly now, this is only about a 25 second time lapse, but in that we cram in the uh, three plus minutes of total eclipse and watch for the shadow as it approaches from the Southwest. Wow. And now watch just as quickly as the shadow, the back edge comes up and behind and woof, and here we are back in daylight again. Isn't that amazing? That's it. That's I, when I go, saw that. Go, I said, go back. Go back to the dark part. I'll I'll stop it at the dark part. I'll uh, hang on. Whoops. Now here you can actually you can actually see the leading edge of the shadow right here coming toward us now. And here it's just getting ready. It's just reaching the sun. When it reaches the sun, the shadow does. That's when totality begins. And now we're in, oh, I was wrong. So here's the sun overexposed a bit with the corona. And that dot that you see there, 
That's the planet Venus, which has come out. And again, now in, in, in this darkness, it's really like the equivalent of like 40 minutes after sunset. And you could see now, but already you could see the back edge of the shadow because look down here, it looks like a sunrise taking place because that's the part of the shadow that, uh, or th that's the part of the sky now outside of the shadow because the shadow again is moving up like that. And if we move, move along here, Boom, we're back out in, uh, in, uh, in daytime again. Really amazing. Uh, that, that's, 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 imp that's impressive. That really is impressive. Joe, you got to see one of these. Now, all I don't know. The bird, the birds all got quiet. Well, it, we didn't have really that much wildlife uh, in the vicinity, but I, I know. Well, you were at a college campus. There's plenty of wildlife, but that's of a different nature. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but but there were people who did say who were close to wildlife and did see birds. In fact, I saw um, down in Texas they somebody took a, a, um, um, a video of flamingos. Maybe it was at a zoo, and just before totality, all the flamingos were all huddling together, like what's going what's going on or whatever. It it really is an amazing sight, and I, I urge everybody to get it to to go and see one. At least you cannot leave this earth you can at least once in your life you have to experience this is just an absolutely incredible amazing spectacle a total eclipse of the sun and once you see your first then you'll realize why that weird guy rayo has traveled around the world every time not every time but a lot of times when it when one occurs to uh to see see another they're very addictive the next one by the way will be on august 12th 2026 and that will be visible from greenland Great place to take the wife and kids, or Iceland. Not bad, uh, but uh, probably the best place, the best places to go. The Iberian Peninsula of Portugal and Spain. That's when the shadow will again visit the Earth, and those are the places that it will touch down over. So make your reservations now, I guess. Thought I saw you know, I, 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 there was a website that that had um, all the eclipses coming up in the next like fifty years or something. With the maps of the path, you know, with the path right. of the totality. I think there was, if I remember correctly, there was one that was in Alaska. Uh, one Nine, in, that's 2033. 2033. Okay. And was there one in the middle of the Pacific Ocean somewhere? Oh, there always one in the middle of the Pacific. Well, They've got to remember, with, on this planet, which is 75% water, most of the eclipse tracks are either over the Atlantic or over the Pacific Ocean. And that, that has helped the cruise industry. I and mean, you have no idea how many times we have ocean eclipses where eclipse cruises are made. And uh, and that one coming up in 2026 will be over the North Atlantic. So I would not be surprised if there'll be a lot of cruise ships off the coast of Portugal for that ev event coming up. Well, what if what if you had an eclipse where you know, I was you know watching on the satellite, you know, watching it on the satellite, it was like this big black dot, okay, that just you know, moved up along the path of totality, and then I had a, a loop of the of North Atlant of the North Atlantic. So after it came off of Maine, you see the black dot go east of Newfoundland, and then all of a sudden it disappears because right. the sun was setting. And I'm just wondering, what would what would an eclipse look like if you caught it, if 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 you were to catch it closer to sun sunset or sunrise? Well, I've seen a sunrise eclipse. Uh, I was on a cruise ship off of Nova Scotia in uh, 1999. And what happens is, is that the sun comes up looking like lobster claws because it's in a crescent type phase. And then just as it mounts above the horizon comes the shadow. The shadow is weird. It looks like a bar, if you will, a black. It, it's not like what we saw yesterday in Plattsburgh. It's kind of like a giant black bar, uh, maybe... 10 or 20 degrees wide. Your, your fist are held at arm's length. The width of your fist is about 10 degrees. So imagine, if you will, just a giant black uh, wedge, if you will, that comes in from the right, and it just comes in and, and moves toward the sun. And as soon as the sun is within that wedge, that's when you have totality. When it's in the middle of the wedge, you see you know, the midpoint of the eclipse, and then the back edge is when totality comes to an end. But it's interesting, Joe, you've often seen, I know, uh, when the sun comes up or the moon comes up or when they both go down, when they're close to the horizon, there's some kind of a physiological thing uh, that takes place that makes them 
the the images of the sun and the moon look enormously large, right. bloated, if you will, much much bigger. And with that eclipse in 1999, I saw an absolutely gigantic sun rimmed with a uh, the outer atmosphere, the corona, by far and away the, the biggest or, lo- or or largest to the eye uh, spectacle of a total eclipse that I have ever seen. And uh, again, it was a and that one only lasted for 50 seconds, but it, it was an amazing sight. So whether you see it low near the horizon or whether or not it's high in the sky like we had yesterday, you you really do have to see uh, a total eclipse of the sun once in your life. So can you, re- uh, Alan Miller, uh, uh, you were in the middle of uh, talking about the next one in, in Greenland and Iceland, and then you mentioned some other countries. So could you mention those again? Because he he got a he had an ad pop up, so he oh, wasn't able. To yeah, see it was it, the it's Greenland, and actually that eclipse begins. On the other side of the world, I believe over over Siberia. Then it comes up over the polar oh, we, region. We all go there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't be. Don't laugh. There are people who actually do that. They're crazy. Well, I'm sure. That. Um, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people trying to see that from the air, from uh, above the uh, normally cloudy environment of Siberia. But it also, as I said, moves over. Uh, I, I think it slices over the uh, eastern part of Greenland over much of Iceland, and then as it's moving towards sundown and getting ready to lift off the surface of the earth, it'll be over Portugal and also Spain. I think Madrid is just barely outside of totality and gets like 99.8% or 99.9%. You could walk from Madrid into the zone of the total eclipse. And one other thing, Joe, that I mentioned, I put it on my Facebook page because I noticed this yesterday because every it seemed to me like Everybody, everybody was just stopping what they were doing to look up into the sky and look at the uh, this event. And I wrote, for a nation that has been pulled apart by every manner of division, this eclipse yesterday offered a moment of unity, however brief. It was uh, a reminder to everyone on the same day and at the same time that life can be magical and that uh, being alive is a collective experience. There is something astonishing about being part of the greater story of things. And I, I, you know, yesterday, uh, for a few brief moments, we all came together and nobody was talking about politics. Nobody was talking about uh, wars going on in other parts of the world. Everybody just stopped, looked up, gawked, cheered. And it's a pity that we don't have these things happen more frequently. Um, But uh, again, for a short time yesterday, the, the, the main headline, was uh, the the great eclipse of 2024, which has now gone into history. Well, you'll be happy to know that one of the brainiacs on The View said that the eclipse was being caused by climate change. Oh, you, no, you got to be kidding I'm me. I'm not kidding. You I mean, gotta... uh, unless, I, unless I read this off a satirical website. <laughs> but... <laughs> The uh, eclipse. Maybe, maybe it was... Sat- well, it, the way the article read, it didn't read like satire, so... And I'm... I'm usually attracted to satirical articles, so that's you know it's easy enough. It's easy enough. Well, to they check. Were someone go on someone. YouTube and type. Go on YouTube and type the view, comma, uh, eclipse, and if whatever that, whoever said that, it's probably there. So yeah. Well, apparently, someone, one of the other brainiacs, said no. It was, you know, it was already scheduled. <laughs> Everybody knew about it for years. You know that kind of thing. The, um, the, the thing about the thing about this is that that was a uh, yeah as I once said with another eclipse it's a play whose script was written eons ago right apparently and, uh, the folks on the chat board will watch the view because they've all said that it was said that it wasn't Austin. satire yes <laughs> oh rich rich Rothmansky says that well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to read, read the thing. It's about well, I saw it. Yeah, uh, Sonny, Sonny Hostin or Hoskins or whatever. Well, look, to, on the other side of that, too, is the fact that, you know, the uh, the eclipse is going over the, the, the cities of, what was it, Nivea or something from the Bible. And, and there's like seven cities and it's a prophecy of, of, the, of, of the apocalypse and... Uh, uh, destruction, you know, the end of the world. Well, you know what? Um, it's off schedule. The eclipse came. We're 24 hours later. We're still still here. Okay, so the world didn't just, end. 
you know, and it just also goes to show you that there are a lot of people on television today who have no knowledge of science whatsoever and have absolutely no reason to say the stupidity that comes out of their mouths because they invented it in their head and say, you know, that sounds good. I think I can get away with saying that and go ahead and say it. And, uh, you know, it, it has nothing to do with climate change. It has nothing to do with, uh, you know, something is really going on. You know, as I said, this was, I, I could tell you, and I, again, I think I may have mentioned this, one of my mentors at the Hayden Planetarium, uh, who uh, was also the co-discoverer of radio emissions from Jupiter, Dr. Ken Franklin, who was the former chairman of the Hayden Planetarium, 54 years ago, with another eclipse that was being covered by CBS, he was talking with Charles Kuralt, the late, great Charles Kuralt, one of the great newscasters. And Kuralt said to Dr. Franklin, I understand there's going to be a really great eclipse coming in 2024. And Franklin went into the long dissertation, April of 2024, going to come up from Mexico through Texas and go up along the eastern part of the United States. And he said, and that's, and he said, he emphasized that that's April 8th of 2024. And Kuralt said, well, that's a rather long time to wait. Again, this was 1970. And right. Dr. Franklin and Dr. And I'm sitting there as a 13 year old kid watching all of this. And Dr. Franklin said, well, unfortunately, I'm trying to imitate him that he had a kind of a high voice. He said, well, unfortunately, that's the way, way of the world with these things. These, sometimes you have to go to them. They don't necessarily come to you, but they will be coming to us 54 years from now in 2024. And Ken died in 20, 2007, but I, I, I was thinking about him yesterday and a couple other people who I remember from the planetarium when we used to discuss this. And that 2024 was way into the future. And I said, God, I'm going to be an old man when, when that comes along. And, and here we are. And here we are. And it here we are. Came, it went. And uh, it, it has been followed. It's trailing in its, in its wake with stupidity like what we heard about on some other television stations. But. Well, the next totally, the next, to, the total eclipse was it 20, 20 Well, in, the, in, in, in if you want to say the United States, yeah, then you have to include Alaska because that is, after all, well, our, no, no, but I'm talking yeah, the uh, the the lower forty eight. Was it wasn't the, it the, like the contiguous the contiguous twenty seventy nine or something? Well, no, August August of twenty forty four, Montana and North Dakota. Okay. 2040, 2045, we've got one going coast to coast. It'll be passing over Florida. It'll be going over Disney World in 2045. Can you imagine, Joe, trying oh, to make yeah. a Yeah, well, that will be bad. Talk about being, talk <laughs> about being uh, loaded with traffic. And, and 2079, the one you mentioned, that'll be the next one here in New York. It'll, it'll happen at 6.03 in the morning on Monday morning, May 1st, 2079. Don't worry. It'll be cloudy that day. But if it's if it is clear and beautiful, we many New Yorkers won't be able to see it unless they go on one of the tall skyscrapers because it's going to be like one degree above the horizon at sunrise, right after sunrise. So you're going to have to get above the skyscrapers in order to just see the darn sun coming up. If you're you know down on the ground, midtown Manhattan, uh, all those skyscrapers are going to be in your way, and you're not going to notice anything. It'll get dark, but you won't be able to actually see it unless you're way up. All right. Well, I'm glad you got to experience it all. Um, I'm noticing, by the way, I know, I know a couple of you have mentioned about some buffering. I'm, I'm noticing that something might be going on on, on my end. So um, I'll keep an eye on it and we'll see what happens. I will uh, close a few unnecessary windows and hopefully it'll straighten itself out. All right. Let's uh, let's roll to some weather because, uh, of course, it's um, uh, it's another week, so that means we have another major storm to deal with, naturally, because they just don't stop. And it looks like uh, this one is going to be uh, another one with uh, some heavy rain and uh, wind and the potential for some severe weather. From what, what Will I, it ever stop, Joe? Ahead. No, I, ever I'm wondering whether, well, you know, there's hope that next week, there's probably going to be a big storm next week somewhere up in the plains. As long as it just, you know, if it goes that far west, we may actually catch a break next week, which is, I don't know, almost unheard of. But, um, you know, I kind of thought that, you know, I was, you know, looking at things, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning to the idea that, that in this particular instance, the wind might be a bigger issue than the rain, because not only do you have a tightening gradient 
ahead of a, you know, this low is going to go up into Michigan. You got a tightening great gradient on the east side. But the low gets pretty deep when it goes into eastern Canada. So when we go around to the west and northwest winds on Friday, um, it's going to blow for a while, both, uh, you know, on the backside. Yep. Yeah. That's a northwest flow behind the, uh, behind the uh, storm. Yeah. 30, yeah, 40 mile wind gusts. You know, that's what else is new? <laughs> meanwhile, a spectacular day today uh, with temperatures that made it up to 80. Uh, in New York City, because we're at the time of year now where a lot of times you're going to have days like this, where if you get enough sun, uh, you can uh, wind up taking temperatures above uh, forecast highs and forecast guidance highs. So, you know, that's there's that. So it's the warmest day we've had uh, in in, uh, in the Northeast in quite a while. Meanwhile, uh, we've got flood watches up in uh, much of Alabama, southwest Georgia, the Florida panhandle. Um, Pretty much all of Mississippi into Louisiana, southern Arkansas, and uh, northeast Texas, where we've got some a number of counties. And this was an area that WPC was talking about, where with um, cumulative rains of seven to as much as ten inches, and they're well on their way to that. We've got a bunch of flash flood warnings up uh, as we speak tonight in parts of northeast Texas and northwest Louisiana, and even northeast Louisiana. Uh, a tornado watch is in play. At the moment, in uh, northwest Louisiana and east Texas, there's also a severe thunderstorm watch to the west uh, in, um, in Texas. So you see it there in the salmon color. Wind advisories along the Gulf Coast. And other than that, there's a few flood watches up in northwest Indiana, northeast Ohio. So I, I, the map's going to probably fill in with more flood watches uh, in the uh, next 48 hours. Uh, it's supposed to this doesn't really get underway until Thursday. So you're going to probably wake up tomorrow morning and there'll be a lot more in the way of watches. And then we'll probably see a bunch of wind. It might, this might be another situation where you got much of the eastern part, half of the United States under either winter adv wind advisories or high wind warnings uh, with all this. And uh, there's a satellite loop tonight. I mean, let me give this a quick refresh. And I think I think everything straightened itself out as far as the uh, live stream is concerned, from what I'm seeing. Uh, so uh, nice day in the Northeast, but you could see all the clouds and the moisture uh, in uh, in the South, in the Tennessee Valley, in, in the Deep South, moved toward the Southeast and Mid Atlantic states with some high clouds. Uh, the rotation back in West Texas and uh, a couple of blowups uh, of some thunderstorms. You can see these patches of bright white clouds. This is where SPC. Uh, was uh, bullish on uh, on severe weather tonight, and let me bring up uh, SPC's map, and you can see the uh, uh, tornado watch box, the severe thunderstorm watch box, and there's another small extension of that tornado watch where they have a severe thunderstorm watch up uh, there. Uh, this is all in an area of enhanced risk. We have a slight risk. Uh, that extends back into uh, west central Texas, extends east into to the Mississippi Louisiana state line, and north to just north of the Arkansas border. And this comes with an area of 10% tornado risk and the hatched area in, indicating uh, EF2 to EF5 potential uh, from wow. the, the, these thunderstorms tonight. And tomorrow it gets even bigger uh, because SPC has an, a moderate risk. Uh, in uh, southeast Louisiana, southern half of Mississippi, southwest Alabama, uh, enhanced and slight risk pushing up into southern Tennessee, marginal risk all the way up into Kentucky. And this comes with a 15% tornado risk in the moderate risk zone and also an elevated risk in the 10 to 15% area, that hatched area you see there, of EF2 to EF5 uh, tornadoes. And then on day three, this is for Thursday into Friday, uh, we have marginal risk coming up Chesapeake Bay into southwestern New York, slight risk in uh, a good chunk of Ohio, extreme western PA, extreme western West Virginia, and much of northeastern Kentucky, and then another area of slight risk uh, from um, southern part of, uh, well, let's call that southeast North Carolina covering just about all of South Carolina, southern the southern half of Georgia, and uh, northern Florida, 
um, extending up into the panhandle. So uh, Thursday into Friday, the general thunderstorm risk, Joe, they've got it drawn over the Nassau County line, uh, up the Hudson Valley, and then swinging northwestward toward uh, Syracuse and toward the west shores of Lake Ontario. I think there's a chance we might see that margin, that general thunderstorm risk area pushed up a bit, and the marginal risk maybe gets pushed up a bit. And I also think there'll probably be some tornado risk, which they'll show tomorrow uh, when, uh, when, on uh, Wednesday when they do their updates during the overnight. And I wouldn't be surprised if the people who live especially in Texas are going to say, it's the eclipse. That's why we're seeing all of this happen you know, now. I mean, they, they, there was a risk of severe weather late yesterday in Texas, again today, tomorrow. And I'm, I'm sure somebody is going to say, the, oh, it's that eclipse. They shouldn't have, we shouldn't have had that eclipse. Why did they have the eclipse in the first place? What do we need? You know, some stupidity like that. You know. Well, I had a miserable day here. Uh, it was um, uh, raining uh, and temperatures did not get out of the 50s. And just give me a moment here, folks. I'm just going to try. I don't believe it. You mean I actually had a nice day compared to what you had? Oh, it was horrible here. It was in oh. the mid. It was in the mid fifties all day, and it oh. and it was raining. I mean, it did. It didn't pour, but it just. It was this constant rain. It would lighten up every once in a while. Every once in a while, it would pick up. I don't know how much rainfall I got, um, uh, but I haven't checked. I, I I could check on my phone, but it's over on the other side of the room, uh, charging. Uh, but here's the radar tonight, which is very busy in Louisiana. You can see a lot of uh, strong thunderstorms, two severe thunderstorm warnings in play right now. You've got four areas outlined for flash flooding. Uh, there's a break, then there's a few more thunderstorms with some uh, severe thunderstorm warnings up uh, well north of San Antonio and well southwest of Dallas. And then up in northwest Texas, we've got a swirl of heavy rain and some thunderstorms there, though no warnings are are, are showing up. And uh, there's already some shower activity uh, popping up in parts of Ohio, uh, and even a, a severe thunderstorm and a special marine warning uh, well to the west-northwest of Cleveland from a, a, an area of storms there. Also some showers and storms in southern Indiana and into Illinois. A couple of showers moving into North Carolina and southeast Virginia. Got a patch of rain that's just to my south, down near now to about Atlanta, and points southward. But it's kind of a narrow band that extends back uh, into Alabama. Because now the next thing here is we're going to probably have to deal with more of this stuff as this low develops and these you know thunderstorms start to move to the east. Uh, pockets of rain and snow in uh, Montana and Wyoming and Idaho, which aren't amounting to too much. WPC next seven days. So this pretty much this whole storm covers this, uh, we're looking at uh, still several to many inches. They still got that stripe of six inch plus rainfalls in uh, central Louisiana. Now, this is on top of what's already fallen there since late yesterday. So uh, these amounts are going to be, be pretty impressive here. Uh, two inch amounts extended to Georgia. You've got an area of heavy rain also up through uh, the lower Mississippi Valley, and then it goes northeast of the Ohio Valley. Uh, they're looking at three quarters of an inch to an inch and a quarter with a few patches of an inch and a half up the Appalachians into Pennsylvania, parts of upstate New York, and into northern New England. You know, maybe the upside here is that the front you know, comes through quick, quick enough that there's not, a, there's not enough time to put down anything more than, say, three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half. But you know how everything wants to finish wants to outperform. I mean, I can't remember the last time we've had a system, Joe, that did not outperform. So the only the only reason why this might not outperform is because the low track is much further to the west than the prior two systems. But I don't know. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of tropical moisture feeding into this. I wouldn't be shocked if we wind up um, seeing uh, s uh, more than just three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half. Well, you know, on uh, the WPC Day 3 Excessive Rainfall Outlook, they do have, from 12Z Thursday to 12Z Friday, they have a section, the westernmost section of the Hudson Valley and northwest corner of New Jersey, in slight risk or slight chance for uh, flooding, flash flooding, and the rest of the tri-state region in marginal risk. But 
again, as you just pointed out, Joe, if the system goes more west to the west, that's where the heavy duty rains will be. But you know, they've been out. We've been seeing this all all through the uh, spring and into the winter and last fall. These systems outperform, as you pointed out, and it could very well be that uh, before the end of this week, that that area of slight uh, risk of excessive rainfall, which is now mainly north and west of New York City, who's to say that they may decide to expand that and include the New York metropolitan area, maybe even Long Island in that zone before the end of this week, or at least uh, just before the event happens uh, during uh, later Thursday into Friday. But they like to use that slight risk zone as a threshold for putting up flood watches. So if that forecast holds, you could pretty, you can pretty much guess where the flood watches are going to go up for sure. Now you're right. I think I think there's a chance that you can wind up seeing them extended to other areas. This is after all, that's the day three forecast. I'm just going to shoot over to day one uh, because of what's going on uh, in East Texas and Louisiana, and you can see they have a moderate risk there of flash flooding, which is a 40 to 70 percent chance of uh, flash flooding from northeast Texas, northern Louisiana, portions of western Mississippi and southern Arkansas, and the slight risk that goes up into southern Kentucky. And then on day two, uh, which would be uh, Thursday, Wednesday into Thursday, uh, you've got the moderate risk matching up pretty well with the moderate risk for severe weather. So, you know, they kind of, they, they, they've got that all in, you know, pretty much hand in hand, which makes sense. And slight risk that extends all the way up into southern Illinois and southwest Indiana. So, um, yeah, I mean, if if all this, you know, this tropical moisture that seems to be getting involved with all of this, uh, and then, of course, you've got a deepening storm and a negatively tilted trough that we're going to have, yeah, it, would, it wouldn't be a shocker. I mean, would anybody really be shocked if we wound up getting, if we're forecasting three quarters of an inch to an inch and a half, and somebody winds up with the... Uh, you know, 50 to 100 percent more. I, I don't think I would be. I don't think so either. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why would it be a shock? This is all we've been going through. I'm right now, as of 2024, I am just shy of 20 inches of rainfall so far. I mean, this is as of the 9th of April. I've already picked up since the start of this year, almost 20 inches of rain. And now it looks like I'm going to add, add to that before, uh, before too much longer, I'm 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 beginning to think that this might be the year that if we keep going like this, maybe I'll have a hundred inches before the end of the uh, year. But you know, things things change in weather, and I'd like them to change a lot quicker than what they appear to be doing now. Your mountain tops in the northern Rockies and the Cascades, because those are the only areas that have even a small chance of uh, at least two inches, and. Uh, we're only even talking about areas that have maybe as much as a 40 to 50% chance for at least an additional couple of inches. Those pretty soon the snow maps will be going away uh, and uh, won't come back until maybe October or November. In the meantime, now here's what the upper air looks like. And I'm just going to widen this out. Let's use the North America view so we can take a look at what's happening. We have no blocking this time around. Uh, which is, makes this storm a bit different because of the fact that the last two were most were mostly coastal coastal lows that came up. This one's going to be an inland low. Uh, the trough axis is right at about 95 west. So you've got a northern stream feature that's picking up the southern stream. The trough goes negative. You get a cutoff low that forms over Michigan, and then the whole trough just swings up into southeastern Canada. Um, and, and we're probably going to be under the influence of that trough right into Saturday. Then it lifts out, and we still have a bit of a northwest flow. So it looks like there's a short wave that's going to come down with maybe some showers late Sunday or Sunday night as that front goes by. And then after that, we get into a nice ridge posi position here for next week. There's a, a closed high in the northeast Gulf of Mexico. There's a ridge that builds up the east coast of the southeastern Canada. So all the energy is going to be in the west, where we'll probably see a strong storm move out of the southwest and head up toward the Dakotas. And as long as that ridge holds, it should at least keep things relatively calm and maybe, for the most part, rain-free until the ridge breaks down, which it kind of does toward the end of next week. But uh, still, most of the energy going into the west or offshore southeast of Newfoundland, so 
maybe we're going to catch a short break from these once a week major storms uh, that uh, are coming. And then, of course, by the time we get to the end, the, the last day on this uh, forecast on the upper air here, Joe, is April 25th. So we're starting to get toward the time of year where, you know, these deep lows should start to be you know, not quite as as not uh, so deep. Yeah, yeah, not so deep. I guess that's the best way to put it. Thank you. Not not as robust. Not yeah. as robust. Yes. That's one of our favorite words, but the all the mod, the models are pretty much lined up here. Of course they are. Why? There's a low going to the Great Lakes. It's been forecast by the models for days and days, and of course, it's going to go right there. But the the low in the Gulf states here, which is developing now and for tomorrow, is actually pretty wrapped up for a Gulf low on April tenth. You know, it's a it's a nine ninety eight ish low, so you you can understand why with, when you get development like this with a strong enough short wave uh, that far south this time of year that you're going to have. Uh, some widespread severe weather, and you can see the surface low goes up to western Tennessee, southern Illinois, and then makes its way up. Looks like it goes from central Indiana to Detroit, and then in tomorrow, more of an onshore flow. There's a warm front that's going to try to set up. So whoever's north of that warm front probably doesn't get out of the 50s. If you're south of that warm front, maybe southern New Jersey, southern Pennsylvania, southward. You'll probably make it up to 70 or better uh, with some scattered showers around. But it looks like Thursday's the day, really, where we're going to get increasing southerly winds, particularly later Thursday afternoon and Thursday night. The gradient, Joe, gets awfully tight with a 9, what is that, a 983 low uh, in Lake Huron. And then, as I said earlier, you know, you get the front to go by Friday morning, and then suddenly you've got a million westerly <coughs> isobars. And and given the, given that it is April thirteenth, uh, you, you know that this is uh, you get a lot of you know mixing with uh, the time of year. Uh, we're likely to be blowing away here from Thursday night right through Friday uh, into Friday night, although and even into Saturday for a little while uh, before the winds even remotely re relax. And then of course you see this next short wave that comes in with some showers for Sunday night into Monday morning. Turns a little chilly for Tuesday. And there's there's the big low. The next big storm from California, the energy from California, sweeps up into a 978 low in northwest Kansas that goes up into northwest into Minnesota and North Dakota. So that is not coming here. That's going too far north and west. So, so that's the, at least the plus to all of this, is that we don't have another screaming deep low in the eastern part of the United States with the next system. Uh, it never ends. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it just doesn't stop. But I just love it. You know, I just love it when the model, you know, puts does that bullseye eight days in advance anywhere but in the eastern United States this works. It's the bullseye, you know, somewhere – you know, in the Rockies or in the Plains or in the, in, in the Great Lakes, and ninety nine times out, nine, well, maybe not ninety nine times out of a hundred, but I would say probably ninety percent of the time it's going to be there, and it is. Well, we're just going to have to. We can't do anything about it, so we'll just have to deal with it when it when it does finally arrive. It was lovely today, though. I mean, we had a, here in Putnam Valley got to seventy eight degrees. Warmest day that we've had in, well, going back probably last October. Yep. And uh, now we're going to be watching a basically a backdoor front that's going to come on down. While we were while we were enjoying these temperatures, I think uh, Boston had, what, 47, 48 degree readings today? It was let me, let me see on the, flow. Let's see what the highs were. Hold on. Uh, oh, it's after 8 o'clock. They may reset the map. Let me take a look. Okay, observations. I'm clicking. Let's uh, station plot, max temperature. Um, oh, okay. It actually did print them up. All right, that's good. Now let me just let me just make the background. Boston made it to actually to 61. Really? Well, I mean, when I did when I looked this uh, this morning, it was like 11 o'clock, and it was still like 48 degrees. So. Uh yeah, hang on a second. I'll I'll uh, I'll bring up the map here. I'm just just making it a little more visible. 
All right, here we go. So here's the here are the high temperature maps, and uh, okay, so uh, we're looking at Boston got to sixty one at Logan, okay. Inland at Lawrence, it was sixty eight, and then you go a little further west to Fitchburg, it was seventy three. They're down to fifty four right now with an east wind. And Logan's got an east wind. Uh, so it's 45 there now. So you, they've had, you know, they, they've had some kind of passage there. Albany got to 77 today. They're at 68 right now. The wind there is southeast. Just looking up at uh, Laconia is in New Hampshire is 48 after a high of 70. Then they've got an east wind. Meanwhile, um, White Plains, 75 was the high there. Uh, Kennedy got to 70. Now they got a sea breeze. It's south of 22, so it's down to 50, 57. Um, Farmingdale is 55 after a high of 72. Gabreski uh, Airport, West Hampton Beach, uh, 71, the high there, and now down to 54. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Big Knob, Pennsylvania, Joe. Have you ever been to Big Knob? No, I've never. No. <laughs> No, never been to Big Knob, Pennsylvania. Uh, if you ever go to Big Knob, Pennsylvania, Joe, it's somewhere west of Harrisburg. Uh, they are. They got to eighty, and Harrisburg got to eighty-one. Uh, Seventy-nine for Caldwell in New Jersey. Somerville got to eighty-one, and uh, seventy-nine in Philadelphia. Eighty-one for Frederick uh, Airport. Uh, outside of Washington, D.C., Carroll County Regional Airport got to 81 also. Uh, just loving look at Baltimore International, topped out at 77. And uh, let's see, which one is this? I can't get Washington, uh, but uh, Gathersburg uh, is got to 79 northwest of Washington. And Camp Springs to the southeast of Washington got to 77. So it's probably a fair bet to say that. Washington split the difference and got to 78. Well, um, what else can we say here? Um, I'm trying to think of. Well, we could say thank you to Brandon Doherty for hitting Super Chat. Thank you, Brandon. He says, hope you, you saw Totality Joe Rayo, which he did. Um, do you have Briller Jeopardy? I do believe I do. Oh, you do, do you? I do, I do, do. Okay. Yes. So let's do a little Briller Jeopardy. I will get bring it up here from uh, the chairman, Mr. Brillor. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Hold on. See, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta look for Scott because I've got so many people who sent me on Messenger, you know, messages during the eclipse. So my my eclipse chasing buddies, I'm going down, 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 down. Where are you? I know, I know I saw him. So oh, here it is. Here it is. There you go. He sent me this on Saturday at 5 18 p.m. before all hell broke loose or all heck broke loose on the, uh, on the internet for me. And he said, Hi, Joe, on this Briller Jeopardy, latest, latest snowfall in select cities. Now, I understand it's, it's an interesting topic, but Joe, to actually ask you or Anybody on the chat board to give me a specific date, oh. a specific month and day and year for the latest snowfall in select cities? That's a little bit on the uh, on the rough side. I, I don't think anybody's going to really be able to do it. I'll, I'll I'll go through the list of cities and see if you or anybody All on right. the chat. Well, let's 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 try it. So the first one on the list, the latest snowfall in select cities. The, the first one on the list is Minneapolis. Is this measurable snow? <sighs> or is it trace? Uh, that I cannot tell you. All right. Well, let's let's just assume it's either wait a minute, one. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, this is not. Yeah, but he doesn't give. For Denver, he doesn't give anything. But he does give he does give amounts for the other four cities on this list. I read 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 the read uh, again the category the way he wrote it. On this 
edition of Briller Jeopardy latest snowfall in select cities. I will tell you four out of the five that he has on the list is greater than a trace. So all right, okay. So the first city is Minneapolis. Yes, I'll say I'll say May twenty fifth. You want to get the get guess the year? Oh, I'll never guess the year. You know what? You know, the heck with the year. The date. The date is is one thing, and and you you are in snake country with this. Okay, so it's either uh, Chuck Cardillo says May twenty third. So mm -hmm. I said May twenty fifth. Northern Grace said May twenty eighth. Um, William Uber said May twenty fifth. Mike Waterhouse says May twenty fifth. Brandon Darty says May twenty eighth. So it's either the twenty sixth or the twenty fourth. I'll say the twenty fourth. And you are correct. May 24, 1925 in Minneapolis, they picked up one-tenth of an inch of snow. Okay. Well, that's good. The next, that... next, the next one is Chicago. Chicago. I will say for Chicago, May, May 14th. Not bad, really, but it's not snake country. Okay. But it's in the, um, in the vicinity therein, like the Coachella Valley. Um, Mike Waterhouse said May 11th. Jason Fox said May 3rd. Who said no. May 11th? Uh, Mike Waterhouse. Mike Waterhouse, you got it. May 11th. May 11th, 1966, Chicago, the Windy City picking up. Two tenths of an inch of snow, point two. Okay. Next one on the list is Denver. Oh my God. <laughs> and you know Denver. Um, you know Denver, Joe. They have winter right into August some years. Well, I was going to say, let's say, uh, you know, well, we've, they have, they've, we had, what was it, a few years ago, they had that blizzard in late September. Uh, I'll say I'll say June fifth. June fifth. Yes. Where's the bell? You got it. June fifth, nineteen fifty three. There was no um, mention for Denver of how much was recorded, but that is the date that uh, the chairman gives us is June fifth. Okay. What's next? Number four on the list: Salt Lake City. Oh, I this I I don't know. That's that's a tough one. I don't know. Denver's June fifth. Hmm. Um, I'll say June seventh. Joe, once again, Snake Country. Wow, that's that's cool. I'm really I'm just guessing off the top of my head. I should go play a lotto ticket. Maggie P said June second. Um. Christina Pedia said June 6th. And that's it. And Maggie P says June 6th. June 6th, 1914, Salt Lake City. Latest snowfall, two inches of snow. Can you imagine two inches of snow in the first week of June? That's yeah, a no, big I honor. can't. Yeah, I couldn't imagine it. And, and the, the, the last one? The last one was actually next to Lesko. We got a bonus question, too. Seattle. La latest snowfall in Seattle. Oh, this is tricky. This is really tricky. Oh, Seattle. Hmm. I mean, because they get so little. Uh, I'll say this is what I'm. I'm just a wild guess. I'm going to say April, April twenty seventh. Yeah, it's a little bit too deep into April, Joe. Yeah, see, I knew it was. I was going to do an April one. Jason Fox said April twentieth, and that's Snake Country. Oh, the twentieth, Jason. That's close. Uh, April twentieth, so it's either the twenty first or the nineteenth. So I'll say the uh, well. Rich Rothmansky says April nineteenth, and Rich Rothmansky is right. April nineteenth, nineteen twenty seven. Seattle actually picked up 0. 0.2 inches of snow. And now for the bonus question. Oh, the bonus. The boner the bonus, question. The bonus city. The latest snowfall in Dallas, Texas. Oh, 
Texas. In Dallas? Yep. Hmm. I'm going to say... Oh. I want to say the end of March sometime. I'll say March 25th. You're right in that, if, you know, you're in the same ballpark as the end of March, but it's not the 25th. Okay. Uh, Jason Fox said March 20th. Tyler Fiega said the 24th. Northern Grace said the 28th. Nope. Um, Brandon Darty, March 20th. Maggie P., April 1st. What did I say? The 25th? I think you said the 25th, yeah. Patrick Darcy says the 24th. William Uber says the 27th. Of March, though. Yes, yeah. of March. Right. Okay. Still, but we still haven't gotten to it? No, but Michael Azara, you're in snake country with your guess. Uh, and Carol DeCherry, Carol DeCherry got it. March 30th in the year 1926. Believe it or not, Dallas picked up 0.1 inches of snow. What year was it? 1926. 1926. Oh, okay. That's before steam engines took took over and ruined the atmosphere, I guess. So. Correct. Exactly. And you learned that on The View, too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, the uh, Joe and Joe Weather Show podcast is, as always, brought to you by our affiliate Tempest by Weatherflow. Get the revolutionary Tempest weather system. Join the fastest growing observing weather network on the planet. The link is pinned to the description to this podcast. Use the coupon code WINNER2324 and you will get. You will get a whopping 10% off. All right. Um, so um, that's it for tonight. I don't know. Somebody asked before, who was it? Matthew something? Where are you? Uh, I'm just trying to find it. About, you know, the strength of the winds. For If I had to guess at this early stage, as far as winds on the south side, I don't know, 20 to 30 with maybe some gusts of 40 or 45 or 50, and then northwest, similar speeds. I mean, that's just kind of an early guess here. We'll probably we'll be able to put a better finger on everything uh, tomorrow at 7.35 p.m. Eastern time. Yes, we will be here. All right. Everybody have a great night, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Have fun, folks.